Good afternoon. Uh, welcome um, to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Safety, Civil Rights, and Emergency Management Committee. Uh, today is May 4th, 2016. Um, my name is Luang Yang. I'm the chair of this committee. With me today are council members Wright, Pomisano, Gordon, and Quincy, and uh, Council President Johnson will be joining us shortly. Uh, let me go through the agenda really quickly. Um, today we have five agenda items. Uh, four of them are consent items. Um, and uh, the first, first item is a mutual aid agreement with the city of Duluth for our Minneapolis Mounted Patrol Services for 2000, the 2016 Grandma's Marathon. The second item is a contract with the Minnesota Sports Facility Authority. The third item is um, the contract with the Minnesota Sports Facility Authority. Uh, the fourth item is the same, but just for a different matter. And the fifth item is a discussion item on tickle offenses uh, ruling report. And um, council members, let me uh, take care of some housekeeping stuff first. Um, the first thing is uh, I'd like to move to delete from the agenda uh, consent item number three, which is the contract with the Minnesota Sports Facilities Authority for perimeter security at US Bank for up to 25 large scale events. And uh, my understanding is that just item number three is just not ready uh, to go yet. So. Um, if I can, um, should I take a vote on that, Claire? Okay. Uh, so I'd like to move to delete this from the agenda. Uh, any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And then um, I'd like to also, um, I guess, ask for uh, my colleagues' um, indulgence on this. Uh, we have some community members here who uh, would like to uh, um, speak on a matter. and. Um, no, I'd like to just ask that we uh, consider that uh, for item number six, and I will just put that as just, uh, clerk, what can we call that? Just comments. Okay. Okay, we'll just, we'll just do that. Um, council members, any questions on that? Okay. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. All right, great. So we'll leave that at the end um, as item number six. Right, so with that uh, done, um, council members, I'm asking, um, or I'm gonna move for approval of the consent items, items number one, two, and four. Uh, any discussion on any of those items? Right, seeing that there is no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. All right, the item number five on this is the ticketable, ticketable offenses ruling report and this is uh, receiving a report summarizing the district court standing order on pre-appearance <laughs> release procedures and bail and any impact the standing order has uh, on policing in the city and with us today to do the presentations are uh, Mary Ellen Hang from the city attorney's office and uh, deputy chief Travis Glampy from the Minneapolis Police Department.
apologize for that. I always tell people if they want the technological thing, they have to talk to my husband. <laughs> uh, Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Council Chair. Chairman Yang and council members, uh, I'm Mary Ellen Hang. I'm the criminal deputy for the Minneapolis City Attorney's Office. With me is Deputy Chief Travis Glampy. Uh, I'm here. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the standing order that took effect uh, February 23rd that was issued by Chief Judge Peter Cahill um, mm -hmm. regarding some uh, matters that have to do with uh, pre-release and bail. Just to give a little context for this order, um, Excuse me, citations are kind of complicated because there are two types of citations. There are citations that are court required and there are citations that are called payables. A payable offense, a payable citation can be either a petty misdemeanor offense, something like a moving violation, speeding ticket, running a red light, and there are some misdemeanor payable offenses, uh, some of the driver's license and insurance offenses. This has come about by what we refer to as the statewide payables list, and that is authorized by Minnesota statute. It's 609.101 subdivision 4. That allows for this list to be created by the Judicial Council. And so this is, we've had a payables list for many, many, many years. I'm not sure when it started. Um, but offenses are placed on this payables list. Uh, the Judicial Council every year seeks input from uh, state and local agencies, my office, we get an email and we're allowed to submit input on any offenses that are currently on the list or offenses that they are considering putting on the, the list, any changes, we submit those, that input, and then the Judicial Council makes the final determination. The payables list is not just one long list, it's ba basically broken up into categories. They have criminal offenses, things like consuming in public is a payable, minor consumption is a payable, there's various traffic offenses on a list, there's parking ordinances, and they can be both violations of state law and our own city ordinance. And then we have what are called court-required citations, court-required offenses. Those are only misdemeanor level offenses. And what that means is if you are cited for one of those offenses, you have to come to court in order to resolve your citation. You don't have any other means. With a payable offense, there is a set fine amount that the Judicial Council has set. So when I receive a speeding ticket, I can choose to come to the hearing office or to court and contest that, or I can say, you know what, I'm guilty, I just wanna pay my ticket and be done, and I can pay that set fine and all the required surcharges, and I don't ever have to make a court appearance, I can resolve my case. Uh, and so that's really the major difference between a payable and a court-required offense. Again, court-required offenses can be both under state law and Minneapolis city ordinance. So this standing order basically really affects these payable misdemeanor offenses. That's what we're really talking about. Um, for any misdemeanor offense, payable or court-required, a police officer can charge that person by issuing them a citation they can refer the case to my office and a prosecutor will review it and will issue a formal complaint if appropriate. And then for some offenses, and this is where the standing order comes into play, they can, if it's proper, they can be booked into jail and then the jail will issue the charge through what's called a tab charge mechanism. Um, in order to book somebody on a misdemeanor, the, the court rules presume that a person is gonna be issued a citation unless what we refer to with the police and in my office is a rule six reason. It's the rules of criminal procedure, rule six. And there are three reasons why an officer can book someone on a misdemeanor offense. The officer feels the person must be detained in order to prevent bodily injury, injury to themselves or another person, that they believe their criminal conduct is going to continue if they simply cite them and walk away, or they have reason to believe there's a substantial likelihood that person will not appear to respond to that citation. They have a history of ignoring citations uh, or have a history of bench warrants. If an officer can cite to one of those reasons, then the officer can bring that person down to the jail and book them into the jail and have them tab charged rather than issue them a citation. Prior to the standing order, the officers, if they had a valid rule six reason, could book a person on any misdemeanor offense. Since the standing order has come out, the standing order basically prohibits people being booked into jail on a payable misdemeanor offense. So even if the officer has a valid rule six reason under this order from Judge Cahill, 
the jail will not accept that person. They will be told you must issue them a citation and release them. They will not allow them to be processed through the jail. So that's really what this standing order affects is that grouping of payable misdemeanor offenses. So to give you some idea of what we're talking about, uh, this list is obviously not complete, but some of the more, uh, the some of the Minneapolis ordinances that we officers use a lot that are payable misdemeanors, uh, noisy assembly, consuming in public, loitering with an open bottle. So if the officer sees me on the street and I'm drinking a beer and they know that I have 10 bench warrants and I'm not gonna appear if they give me a citation, if the officer tried to take me to jail, they would not be able to book me into the jail. So the officer would have to either write me a citation or refer the case to my office and we can do a criminal complaint. And if, if we issue it by complaint, even if, it's a, even if it's a payable misdemeanor, if I do not appear for that court date, then a bench warrant can be issued and I can be booked in jail on that warrant once, the, once I'm found on the warrant. But, uh, without, but short of issuing it by a complaint, uh, I cannot be booked into jail on these types of offenses. Some payable offenses under the state law um, again, all the driving offenses, driving revocation, driving after cancellation, driving after suspension, uh, open bottle, all the insurance, careless driving, unlawful assembly. These are now, these are payable misdemeanors. And again, under the standing order, people cited for these offenses may not be booked in the jail. Some court required offenses that are not affected by this order are assaults and domestic assaults, obstructing legal process, flee on foot, disorderly conduct, trespassing, public nuisance, fail to obey a police order. Again, these are not full lists of all the court required offenses. If, if you're interested, I can email you the link to the uh, payables list. It's kind of hard to find unless you know where to look and then you can see all of the offenses and the various, they have lots of different lists. They even have them by city ordinances. I mean, it's, it's very complex, um, but these court required offenses, if I am trespassing, and let's say I'm at the University of Minnesota and I'm trespassing and this is the 10th time I've been told you can't go to this building, the officer can cite rule six and bring me down to the jail, believing my criminal conduct will continue and the jail will accept me on these court required offenses. Ms. Ms. Hagen, yes. um, you mentioned the trespassing piece and you said, you know, uh, if an officer has done that, let's say on the 10th time, what about if it's only the third time? I mean, is is that still, you know, a situation where you can cite to rule six and take the person down to jail? Um, I think, yes. Uh, I'll maybe let DC Glampy talk to you about how they train officers, but if the officer can point to a re one of those three reasons, so if they believe, even though it's the third offense, this person is going to remain at the building where they are trespassed. That would be continuing criminal conduct. So even if it's their first offense, they can book them if they can cite that. Or if they have a history of failure, that's not defined. So is that two bench warrants? Is that 20 bench warrants? It is a bit subjective, and I'm not sure what training they provide on how the officers use that discretion. And Mr. Chair, our training is all built around um, being able to articulate and document. And just like Mary Ellen said, if we show up for the first time and you're trespassing and we can show that you've been given proper notice and you say, oh, I don't care, write me a ticket, I'm staying here. That's good enough for us as long as the officer properly documents those exact words and can show that. So it's our training is all around the documentation of that, why they believe the continuance of the criminal activity is going to occur. You can continue. Uh, that's that's, I just, that's kind okay. of it. That's kind of a very short uh, summary of the difference between court required and payable offenses and how they're affected by this order. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Council Member Gordon. I have a couple questions. One is, um, or it's an, one's an answer. Yes, I think it would be nice to have the link so that we could have access to that list. Uh, I'm just curious to see what it is as complicated as it is. I also think that must be... Um, then complicated and challenging for officers to know what is the list of payables that aren't court required. So um, hopefully that's included in the training. I'm also curious, and I haven't read haven't read the um, the judge's opinion in that in the order. Um, but in there, or do you think um, do you are aware of what motivated this? It's, does it have to do with court costs, not wasting the time, or was it was there a concern for kind of consequences and and collateral damage? 
for, for people getting picked up and um, booked when it maybe wasn't necessary and, and that. What was the motivation behind? Uh, Chair Yang, Council Member Gordon, I, I'm not entirely sure, and I don't want to presume to speak for Chief Judge Cahill. Um, one of the things I do know is we, my office, me in particular, we've been participating in the adult detention initiative for the last several months. Uh, we've had a lot of meetings. Um, Commander Johnson from MPD has been actively involved. That is an initiative where members of various justice partners, the sheriff is there, MPD is there, uh, suburban partners are there, the public defenders are there, and we're looking at various areas um, to, uh, to make sure that the people that are being held in jail, both on felonies and on misdemeanors, are the people that, that should be being held in the jail, that there is a public safety reason or some valid reason we, we don't want people to be in jail if they should not be there. So we're really looking at all of this, and I think this, this standing order somewhat fits in with some of those initiatives that we're looking at and trying to come up with different ways rather than booking someone in jail. Some of the things we're looking at um, if someone misses their court date, is there an alternative to having to have them booked in jail and post bail to get them to come to court again? We're looking at um, possibly like a sign in release warrant for your first appearance. Maybe you didn't get the summons in the mail. So when the officer encounters you, you'll be given a chance to say, okay, I'm not gonna book you in jail even though I can. I'm gonna give you a court date in two days. You need to come. And if they show up, we've achieved our purpose. They've appeared, we can hopefully resolve that case. And if they still choose not to appear, then a warrant can go out and the process will play out. Um, so I think that's some of probably where this came from is out of some of these initiatives that we're really all working very hard on so that our system is, is fair and efficient. So both fairness and efficiency. Um, and I'm a little bit curious about the rule six reasoning. So um, the rule six doesn't apply when it's just uh, one of the payable offenses that are on the list. Because even if you even if you thought somebody had a substantial likelihood that they wouldn't respond to a citation, they they won't be accepted at the jail. Is that right, uh, Chair Yang, Council Member Gordon? Um, sort of. They they Rule Six applies to all misdemeanors. So, on a payable misdemeanor, if the officer has a valid Rule Six, they can bring them to the jail. Under this order, the jail will not hold them. So. The effect, I think, is essentially that officers are not going to be bringing people down, even under Rule 6. But again, I'll let D.C. Yeah. Glampy address that. So, uh, Mr. Chair and Councilmember Gordon, uh, Mary Ellen's exactly right on that. We still have the ability to bring the person down and turn them over to the jail, but the jail is not accepting them. So, in essence, it's a wasted trip to do that. The one provision that we do keep from this is we are able to transport somebody to jail if we cannot reasonably identify them, and that would fall under the, um, uh, we believe they wouldn't respond to a citation. Again, you can't write a citation to John Doe and expect they're going to show up. So the jail will allow us to bring them down. They will accept them briefly for the purposes of fingerprinting them and identifying them and then releasing them right back to us to either write the citation or, or charge them by complaint. So we were at least able, and I think there was conversation with both Judge Cahill and the jail to get that provision put in. So we didn't simply have people saying, I'm not gonna tell you who I am, go ahead and issue a citation to anonymous. We were able to keep that part of it. That's correct. So, the, and this is the jail that's operated by the county? Yes. The so does the county have a different interpretation of Judge Cahill's order than we do, or is the, the order that it seems strange that we could arrest somebody and detain them in the car, um, and then we couldn't um, book them and detain them in the jail? Um, it, it's my understanding that the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, they're uh, represented by the Hennepin County Attorney's Office, their civil division, and that the, their representatives have spoken to uh, the civil attorneys in the county attorney's office and they've received advice on this order and how they should interpret this order. Um, and again, I wasn't privy to those conversations, so I can't speak to that, but yes, they have thoroughly discussed it with the county attorneys and the county attorney as their lawyer has given them their advice on how they should proceed based on this order from Judge Cahill. And if I could add to that, Mr. Chair and Council Member Gordon, uh, one of the key terms that Judge Cahill used was a definition continued detention 
which signaled to us, and it was kind of agreed that you can detain somebody that when, once you book them into jail, that becomes a continued detention, and that's what he specifically prohibited. I know when we asked for clarification on the identification, that word was those those words were very clear. So I think it's that whole continued part that really is what's being enforced by Hennepin County. Okay, that's interesting. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councilmember Palmasano. Did you? Um, Mr. Chair, I could be wrong, but the obvious but not yet stated undertone here seems to be about, about jail reform and about the exorbitant cost of bringing somebody and booking them in jail for what is otherwise a payable citation. And I'm curious if does this fit in or doesn't it fit in with some of our own policing reform initiatives? You know, in, in my view, it's almost different. Maybe it, it fits in within the context of having at about the same time, but I think it's a little bit different from, you know, what we've done, let's say, here at the City Council. And may I ask, how does the communication of this across our officers work, or has that happened already? Uh, D.C. Glampy, could you? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Palmasano. So we put out a three-page administrative announcement to our officers spelling this out, and it was actually done in uh, collaboration with the city attorney's office, where, uh, interestingly enough, the links, as Councilmember Gordon referred to, are contained in this announcement. So our officers have real-time access to these lists through, through the links on our internal website. Uh, on top of putting out a detailed step-by-step -step instruction guide for our officers, we also pushed that message down through their supervisors. So not only was there um, an announcement, but there was that kind of face-to-face -face discussion at each individual command through their commanders and their supervisors. And, and certainly each precinct then has a community attorney assigned to it who is there as a resource. And it's expected that if you have questions, you certainly can turn to not only your supervisors, but your legal um, kind of advisor at the precinct. So there's plenty of resources available for the officers in this regard. Thank you. This seems really thorough um, and it's rather complex stuff and it is a change. I can only imagine what it would be like trying to not only know all of this for the first time, but then make this modification. So thank you. That gives me comfort. In D.C. Glampy and uh, Ms. Hang, you know, what what I've gotten from my office is just kind of, um, you know, to, to the earlier question with regards to coordination between the city attorney's office and the uh, MPD, that uh, somewhere along the lines, the message hasn't been clear. And so on certain offenses, let's say like trespassing, you know, there's been a question mark. Um, different folks have interpreted things differently and those sorts of things. But I mean, hearing from you both, I mean, it seems like there has been coordination between the city attorney's office and MPD uh, in, in a real way that um, allows for people to understand what the, um, what the uh, letter from uh, Judge K, uh, Chief Judge Cahill is, is that correct? Uh, yes, Chair Yang. Um, it, it, as you can kind of tell from my presentation, I think people think the world of citations, how complicated can that be? It, it can be extremely complicated, sometimes more complicated than, than some of our more serious felony offenses. And, you know, I've been working in this area pretty much since I started in the city attorney's office. And so I understand all the little nuances. And from a law enforcement perspective, they've never had to pay, they never had to be concerned with, is this a payable or a court required offense? What they had to be concerned with, do I have probable cause to charge this person and then make their decision on how they're going to do that? This has been a very big change for the officers on the street. And we we didn't have a, a lot of notice. The district court gave us a few weeks. Um, and, un and unfortunately, uh, it fell, unfortunately, when I was out of the office for two weeks. And so when I got back, we were a little scrambled to uh, get, and we had some unanswered questions. Uh, one of the big questions was, what do we do with someone that we can't identify? And it took a little bit of time to get some of that worked out with the jail. They were very cooperative, and we were eventually able to get the answers. And then as soon as I had all the information, I put that out to my community attorneys, and I sent it to uh, D.C. Glampy so we could get this AA out. We didn't want to put anything out until we had all of the answers because we, I felt that would just make things more confusing if I said one thing and then had to backtrack a week later. Um, but this is, this is a really big change for officers. And 
they now have to know some of these little details that they didn't know and realize, is this a payable versus a court required? And so it's going to take some time. I think they've done a great job over the last several weeks really adjusting to this and adapting to it. And I just know from talking to my community attorneys, they are getting asked a lot of questions. The officers are not shy. My community attorneys have been well-versed in this. Um, I've made sure that they've seen everything I've sent to MPD. And so I think it's just going to be continual work to continue to educate people so they understand what offenses this really applies to and how it affects the day-to-day -day enforcement. Okay. Uh, Council, members, uh, Council, Council President Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Ms. Hanga and um, Chief Clampy. I think, you know, it's a, it's a learning process for us, for our officers, but it's also a learning process for the community. And I think one of the things we have to think about is how do we get the message out to um, the people in the community who are dealing with some of the, the problems that, you know, used to be more hastily resolved in the removal of someone from the scene. Um, uh, that isn't happening now. And so, you know, how do we get that word out to the business associations, to, um, um, you know, people where where we have kind of some of these problems and, you know, what the um, solutions are that are available to the officers? That That's going to be part of, you know, where we need to go next, I think, after, after we get people trained about this. Um, Chairman Yang, uh, Council President Johnson, uh, I agree. And again, this is, I think, this is, this is an area where we're going to heavily rely on our community attorneys. And, um, you know, Susan and I have the utmost faith in our, well, four, we're, we've, we're in the process of picking a new community attorney for the 5th Precinct, um, but that person will be just as good as our current four. Um, and again, I've talked to them about this order, and I know that they have discussed it at some of their various community meetings, and I've encouraged them to discuss it so that, especially Heidi Johnson, our 1st Precinct attorney has spoken to the business community and, and let them know that this is what's going on and this is how it is going to affect some of the enforcement. And again, she's made herself available for questions. And I think we'll just continue to do that along the way as they attend more community meetings. If this is an area that the community wants more information of, we're happy to give some education and answer some questions on how this is really going to affect their, their daily lives. Thank you. Council member Palmasano. Mr. Chair, um, I, I'm curious just because I don't know, what does it take um, to identify somebody, a minor or, a, or an adult? And I recognize this isn't a change, but now it matters more because it's an element of how something would be processed. Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Palmasano, um, the, the easiest way, quite honestly, is through a driver's license or other government issued ID, a passport, um, both foreign and domestic. Um, from there, uh, if they don't have an ID on them, we have the ability to look up their uh, driver's license information online to you know, get a match with the picture. Uh, for juveniles, it's a matter of finding a responsible adult who you can both identify the adult and then we'll provide a, you know, identification for the, for the juvenile at that point. Uh, beyond that, you know, you also have um, certain like military IDs you can use, and it really comes down to verifying the version that you're getting from the person as well as to, you know, does their address match? You can look back at, you know, former records, and if somebody can't tell you their address but they're in our system, you know, 20 times, well, something's, something's up at that point. But generally, it's the government ID is the easiest way to do it, and then um, minus that, if they don't have some sort of ID that you can verify in your squad, that's where the jail can then use fingerprints and see if there's anything on record at that point. Thank you. And I'm curious, um, what do mistakes here mean? I think it just means that, well, you take them down and then they don't get accepted in jail, so you need to take them back from where they were picked up. Um, and, and I know that you, you said there's a lot of places to ask and to check in with the precinct attorneys and stuff, but I just imagine that especially the learning curve here. Um, right. That, that officers will um, be trying to do the right thing but make the wrong decision. So does it just mean they get to the point of booking them in jail, jail won't accept them, and so they get brought back? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Palmasano, that's what we're encouraging our officers to do is if there is a mistake or even if the officers are right and maybe the mistake is on somebody else, maybe the jail makes a mistake. Um, bottom line is we want to bring the person back to the point where they were removed from or a point of safety. So if that happens to be the 
the precinct or somewhere safe, we want to bring them back as close as possible and essentially start from scratch because there you're looking at a good faith mistake and a good faith effort, and that will, will save us pretty much every time. Thank you. Uh, DC Glampy, just um, I'm going to use kind of a example here of trespassing in a situation where you know person first gets trespassing. Uh, I guess warning. I mean, they get a warning first, and then after that, I mean, let's say they their second warning. I mean, conceivably, if it uh, fits within um, uh, Rule Six, then they can certainly be taken to jail. Is that correct? Yes, under the state state statute. Yes. Okay. Okay. So it's not. It, is it a ticketable offense or is it a bookable offense or what what is it exactly it, it's it's both mr okay. chair um the discretion lies with the officer um that's a non-payable yeah. so they have the opportunity to take them to jail if they can articulate the ongoing criminal activity or if they feel the citation will get the job done that, that yeah that's their option okay oh, council president johnson Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, one thing I, I would ask, and so under this ruling, and this is a huge problem we have in North Minneapolis, when someone is um, uh, issued a citation for no driver's license or um, driving after suspension, driving after revocation, no insurance, those are then, um, no matter what the record is, if they've had 100 uh, driving after revocations, we just issue them another citation, or oh. what happens then? Uh, Chair Yang, Council President Johnson, um, we have uh, we thought about this issue and we have created some criteria. We've actually had it for a while um, where we've given some guidance to uh, MPD. We've also given it to the Park Police. They're interested in this issue and we've given them some guidelines to consider uh, when they encounter someone who maybe this is their 10th or 11th time of being stopped without a license that they can look at that criteria and then if that criteria is met, they can choose to rather than cite them, they can choose to refer that to our office and we can review and issue a complaint. And if we issue a complaint, even if it is a court required offense, such as a driving after revocation, that person will be required to come to court. It is no longer payable by the fine. By us issuing a complaint, we're basically pulling it out of that payable world and putting it into the court required world. And they will have to come to court and they will have to see a prosecutor. They'll have legal representation if they qualify for a public defender or bring their own attorney and we'll resolve it that way. And so we've given some guidance as part of this training to the officers for people that they, that they see that are repeat offenders for any payable offense. We've told them we are very happy to review those and charge them by complaint because I think that's an appropriate use of our charging authority because we don't want to have the situation where people just think, I don't ever have to get my license because I don't ever have to come to court and they can't book me in jail. No, we have other mechanisms that we can use for these repeat offenders, and Great. we're using them. Great. Thank you. Council members, any other questions? All right. Well, I will move to uh, receive and file this uh, report. Um, any discussion? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, we will go to our uh, item number six here, and it's a comments uh, period. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to start by just saying that, um, you know, we'll open it up for comments, and uh, comments should be held to two minutes. And, uh, you know, my understanding of this is that uh, there are community members who are here who want to talk about uh, Inspector Friesleipen, and I just wanted to make it clear that uh, for us, I mean, from what we know, this is uh, paid administrative leave. Uh, that's the extent of it. And I'm going to turn it over to our city attorney just to give us uh, some advice on this. And then we we'll oh, can kind of go from there. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, I don't know what the topic of the public commentary will be. But regardless, um, if it involves any ongoing personnel matter, um, I wouldn't take any questions or answer any questions or make any public comments about that at all, uh, just due to the uh, uh, nature of the Data Practices Act issues involved. OK, thank you. All right, so um, anybody who wants to step up, please, two minutes. Yeah, right in back there. Chair Yang and council members, thank you for hearing us. Uh, I'm here today to express my great concern and anger over how Inspector Mike Friesleben has been suspended from his duties after 28 years of service in the Minneapolis Police Force. In that time, 
He has had a perfect record with 28 medals, awards for his exemplary service. Last year alone, he attended 350 of the 600 total appearances at community events in the 4th Precinct. Free Slavin grew up in North Minneapolis and has spent most of his career as a street cop, mostly night shifts. For him to have a perfect record over 28 years and still love and commit such passion to his job is nothing short of amazing. I'm a 15-year resident of North Minneapolis community. I have two daughters in Minneapolis Public Schools. We have made North Minneapolis our home. I am well aware of the challenges that our community faces. The unfortunate death of Jamar Clark last fall puts a greater focus on the severe distrust of police officers in North Minneapolis. There are no easy answers to a deep systemic problem that has many layers stemming from many years of pain. It is a pain that wells up from a community that has been marginalized and taken advantage of for far too long. Much of the anger at cops is misdirected, and there are a lot of great cops serving the community well. One thing I know, truthfully, we are all losers in an ugly aftermath to Jamar Clark's death. There's a lot of collateral damage that will take many years to heal. I do not envy the position that law enforcement faces over the coming months and years. I also do not envy the hard issues that our city leadership is forced to make decisions about that have no single right answer. One thing I know for certain, Mike Friesleben is the type of person who has spent much of, most of his life being part of the solution. He is a true public servant and all of his awards and years prove it. All of his awards over the years prove it. So removing him from his leadership- You can wrap up. Okay. Your two minutes almost up. All right, thank you. Uh, well, I, I have this letter that I could turn in. Okay, sure, you can do that, yes. All right. So if you can if you can state your name and your address for the record, that would be great as well. Oh, it? Or it's right on the letter there? It is. Okay, if you can just do I that. I just have one more paragraph. Like, sure, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I'll close by being very blunt. If one of the best cops among us gets taken down in a politically motivated agenda in the aftermath of Jamar Clark's death, I and many other people of North Minneapolis will be deeply hurt by our leaders. I will not reserve judgment against the city leadership the next time something bad happens. The firestorm created by Jamar Clark's death should be a lesson that we need to learn from and support community leaders like Friesleben. The anger and hurt in our community is not gone. It is merely under the surface waiting to see the actions of our leaders. Getting rid of Mike would be a grave mistake. It would be a mistake that will not go unnoticed and will not be forgotten the next time our law enforcement is under scrutiny. Thank you. Sir, could we get your name and address for the record, please? My name is Stephen Walden. And your address? Address 1531 Logan Avenue okay. North. Okay, thank you. I have five copies. Okay, perfect. Just right over to the clerk. Anybody who is going to speak, uh, if you can sign in with the clerk first before you come up, and Ms. Clemens, you can, you can go do that real quick. Talk a little fast. All right, two minutes. Okay, two and a half. Okay, I'm Lisa Clemens. I'm from a Mother's Love Initiative in North Minneapolis. I've been working with Inspector Freeslaven for years, but uh, we have a closer bond now since he's been the inspector of the precinct. I'm part of the Justice Department's uh, community engagement team, and I've been doing that for 18 months, and I feel like I wasted my time. Everything that we have discussed in 18 months is exactly what Inspector Freeslaven is doing in our community. Exactly. And that has never happened before in North Minneapolis. In light of the Jamar Clark incident or shooting, Inspector Freeslaven never stopped working in our community. When the verdict was coming down, he called me and he said, Lisa, what do I need to do? I said, you need to pull in all those contacts and resources that you made in our community. And he did that. He went and sat down with the clergy, the business owners, the elderly, the grassroots people, 
He talked to the teachers, the, the, the students in the schools. He did everything that no one else has ever done. We understand that this is a personnel issue. We understand that. But I'm asking you this because I know how the game gets played. When this is done, we want him back. If we can't have him as an inspector, we want him working in our community in a capacity that has him working with the people in North Minneapolis community. When they said they were gonna burn down North Minneapolis, it was his contacts in the community that stopped that from happening. And I think you should remember that when you finally get one, when you say MPD 2.0, this is it. This is it. We're all coming together now in that community to fight. If you have another Jamar Clark, I don't know that that will happen. But I know that it's happening right now. So if you have to create a storefront that he runs a team out of to stay in our community and in our schools, and just give me one more second. We're doing inspector of the day, for the day. Each month we've done like four of the seven schools. And these kids absolutely love it. They give roll calls. They go in the squad. The dispatch recognize them as the inspector when they log on. Thank you you have never seen this before in our community. So just think about finding a way to keep him in our community. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mari Melander, and I live at 6227 Clinton. Hey, John. Um, I never get into this kind of stuff. So I'm gonna I'm stepping out of my comfort zone and I'm just saying that publicly. Um, I'm 20 years in Minneapolis public schools and I'm in a leadership position right now. And I know what it's like when you have a situation that you can't speak publicly on. So I understand that and I understand your attorney's advisement not to respond to questions, but I also appreciate that you're willing to hear us out because I do believe you guys have some decision-making authority in this, whether you wanna completely own it or not, you all have influence and you can exercise that influence accordingly. And so what I will say is that in my business of education, we know that teaching is not a science, it's an art. There is no script that I can give any teacher and have them go into a classroom and be able to work the magic that magical teachers can do. There's two other careers that are comparable. That's medicine and law enforcement. It is an unpredictable reality. You go in every day and you bring who you are, not what you are. It's hard to explain why some officers can go in and they can immediately de-escalate a situation and others can't. It's the same thing with teaching and it's the same thing with medicine. Why are some doctors and nurses so gifted and it's the same thing with Mike. He is so gifted. You can see it and you can feel it in everything that he says and does. It's like watching some of my best teachers. He works magic. And it's going to be a very serious message that's sent to all of us that are putting ourselves in these positions every day, sacrificing our own personal sides for our professional sides, regardless of race or social status if he is allowed to be removed from his role as inspector of the 4th Precinct. I hope you take that very seriously. Thank, Thank you for you. hearing us out. If I may, that buzzing noise that goes off, that's not me being rude, that's the two minute timer. So if when you hear that, if you can kind of come to a close, that'll help. Thank you. Thank you, my name is Echofik Burnett and I live 2218 DuPont Avenue North. And I'm here today to talk about Inspector Free Slavin because I've seen, since I've been in North Minneapolis for the last three years, I've seen how he engages with our residents and urban home works in the community and the children in the community. And I've seen how the community mindsets have changed when it comes to engaging with the police. And it's all due to Inspector, it's all due to his leadership. He is a good leader. And I've seen even how when the police officers come out to answer a call and how they engage with the community, the engagement level is even different. They're able to call residents and people out by name. They're able to engage with them in positive ways. They're able to call Inspector Freeslave and give him information about shootings and drug dealing when before that never happened. And it's due to the, the fact that Inspector comes out 
and he engages with the community. He knows them. He knows the kids. The kids actually wants to be police officers. And that's due to the fact of him having the type of heart that he has to give and to make for sure that there is equality all the way around. And to have him removed from our community would be a deficit would be a deficit because he sees our community and he sees the people in our community as assets, not as a negative, but as a positive. He takes the kids out and he plays basketball with them. Them young men, when they do inspector of the day, to see that to see them light up and to see that they can be something, that they can actually be something when the world tells them that they can't, to have a police officer stop you when you used to do your car like this and now due to the fact that the engagement of Inspector Free Slave, and they rolling their window down, and they actually engaging with the police officers. They don't have to worry about when they see a police officer, they they getting on paranoid because now they're able to engage with them. All because Inspector comes out and he engages with them. And I just want you guys to know that taking away from our community will bring more deficit. Please don't do that to North Minneapolis. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Philip Murphy. Um, I own the flower shop on Dowling next to the cemetery. Uh, it's one of the oldest, longest running businesses in North Minneapolis. It started life in 1896. The property was then Crystal Lake Township. Um, it was annexed shortly thereafter by Minneapolis. And, um, you know, the life in that area is slowly being squeezed out by, by this, gunfire. And this is the shots map that ended at midnight on Monday. So the press release last week touting the huge reduction. Well, that was for the week we had all the rain. So I just want to point that out. Um, yesterday at 1.30, a woman, very pregnant, 35th and Irving, literally was running for her life with three toddlers. Bullets, incoming rounds, went into her house, 35th and Irving. So this is what we face. Very, very real consequences of being in North Minneapolis. Monday, I found a new bullet hole in my building. That's hole seven since the 4th of July last year. Um, my clients, I tell them not to come to the shop, shop online or call. You know, if one of them gets shot, mugged, or beaten on my corner, well, I have to live with that. You know, so things aren't so simple. Now, Inspector Friesleben, I hear this. I thought it was a joke, April Fool's, May Day joke, something. But no, no, this is some kind of bizarre reality put on us by City Hall. And it can't be true, but it is. He's the only inspector we've had short of Tim Dolan that's actually come into my flower shop in 26 years since we've been here. And since we took that property over from the Stern family, which had been there since 1904. And... Uh, so I'm aghast. I, I don't understand the dynamics of this loss to our community. And, um, well, if he is actually taken away from the resource of North Minneapolis, well, it's going to make life here a lot more complicated for businesses, uh, the kids, the police, the police athletic lead. Do you go up to the sock, any of you guys? Mr. Murphy, can you finish up on your thought? Well, I'm going to tell you. They're taking down pictures of SWAT with AR-15s, and they're putting up pictures of kids in there. And that's because of his presence and his work with the Police Athletic League. Kids are in there now doing their athletics up at that sock center. You know where it is, 41st and DuPont. Walk up there, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Spend some time up there. Spend some time with the kids. Do some of the work he's doing. And if he's gone, well, one of y'all will have to step up and do the work that he's doing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Yang. I can't even believe I'm here. And I'm really emotional about this because I've been on the ground in the north side for 50 years. And for 50 years, I've never seen anybody engage our community like Inspector Free Slavin has. I've seen him do things that no one else has done. I ca often comment that our kids in K-5 have great relationships with the SROs. But by the time they get to middle school, something went wrong and all of a sudden, the police are the enemy and the kids are the target. With the inspectors 
participation in the middle schools. We now have kids having relationships with the police department that are not confrontational, not violent. There's nobody laying on the ground. Nobody's hands are up. Suddenly, these are people working with our kids in our buildings. Yesterday, when I was standing in front of the 4th Precinct, someone who had been inside said that our new inspector, Joe, said that those programs will not continue because he doesn't have the energy that Mike had, and he's not Mike. I need you to understand that a lot of us call him Mike because we feel like he's more our friend or a member of our family than he is an officer controlling our community. He has done so many wonderful things. I have had so many phone calls about this, I can't even believe it. And there are people out here who have been working with him to take guns off the street and give them to the inspector who tell me now that's the end of that because I'm a felon and there's no way I'm going to have a gun on me and call another officer to come get it, yet we have been taking guns off the street. I don't know what else I can say. Well, that last thing that she talked about, the presentation, 10 violations and you're not going to jail. My community's so smart, they'll work that for all it's worth. So it sounds like a setup to me. All I can say is that you stabbed us. Well, we've been stabbed in the heart by whatever happened at the police department because we need the inspector. And if we don't have him, I'm really worried about our summer. Thank you. Um, I'm here today, and I'm speaking on my own free will. I'm speaking for myself. My name is Becca Frieslaven, and I am Inspector Frieslaven's youngest daughter. I've been a member of the Minneapolis Police Department for 28 years, and for the first time in my life, I am speechless. <laughs> he has done nothing but wonderful things for this community. <laughs> So first, I want to say thank you to everyone here supporting him. He's so thankful everyone for everyone's support. And all I'm going to say is that you can try to take Mike Frieslaven away from his community, but you will not take the community away from him. Thank you. Councilman Yang and council members, Council Chair Bart Johnson. Um, my name is Mike Oker. Some of you know me. Some of you are now introduced to me. I run the Four Street Saloon for 16 years now, since 2000. Um, I've had a lot of times and a lot of interactions with police officers in North Minneapolis over the last 16 years, and every one of them has been instituted by either a call from myself or an incident that's happened on near or around my property until Michael Freeslaven was instituted as the inspector at 4th Precinct. Um, those were the ways I had to contact with police, unless I have off duty, which I have regularly that I pay them. <clears throat> they have reason to be there too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> inspector Freeslaven has stopped by my business to talk to me on many occasions, even especially on the busier nights, the Friday and Saturday nights, to see how things are going, what's going on, what can we do together to make things better. He's actually stood out on a corner at bar close with me and uh, observed the things that we go through just because of the, uh, the uh, violence in the neighborhood that's coming. I wanna state one quick incident that I just ran into. Uh, February 20th, we had a domestic ab abuse in our bar. A guy punched his girlfriend in the face. My, my security escorted him to the door with the girl and her friend. They didn't want to press any charges, everything. No, we had an off-duty officer there, Michael Geary, on, on site. And uh, he escorted them into their car, got them off the property, got them to leave. All of this was done without any violence or any, any uh, major interaction. He wasn't happy to be leaving or whatever happened. But what happened 10 minutes later was unbelievable because of this domestic dispute that we were able to exit off of our property and into, you know, uh, uh, away from our, our business. This guy had these girls drop him off at the back of our lot and meet him over supposedly across the street at the other parking lot while he came through with an illegal gun, our parking lot, and came through and started shooting at my staff as well as our officer. There was a squad out there in the parking lot with lights on at the end of the night like we always have off-duty officer in that he had just had a confrontation with in the vehicle, got him out peacefully. 
this guy's got a record with with uh, gun charges already, but he's got a gun and he he fired six times at my staff as well as the Minneapolis police. It wasn't gang related. It wasn't anything related to a uh, uh, anything with a bar. It was a domestic assault. And this guy has an illegal gun in his trunk, and this is what it, the, the mentality is out here in the streets, is that it's okay to be able to do that. Something's got to change. Mike Freeslavin has been there to try to change a lot of this, not only within the community, but as a cop. I mean, he's a great officer. Sir, he doesn't. Can you, can you finish your thought? Huh? Your time is up. Can you finish your thought? That's all, that's all I really have to say. I didn't really come down to, I came down because... Free slave, and we'd love to have him back. He's a dynamite guy. He works with the community and with the with the people involved. So, give him a chance. Give him what he deserves. Thanks, guys. Chairperson Yang, President Johnson, and Council, it's good to be able to speak with you about this today. There's no question that when Inspector Free Slavin came, that he changed, intended to change the culture and the environment of the Fourth Precinct. And in doing that, as we've heard testimony today, he's brought a, brought a great amount of confidence from the community, confidence that has been displayed in schools, on the street, in different places, confidence that was evident during the protests around the shooting of Jamar Clark. He saved our North Side from damage, from, from all kinds of problems that could have come. There was no doubt when he came to bring in the change of culture, there was great opposition internally from the union, from other police officers that despise the changes he was making, that prefer to police with force and abuse than with care and protection for the community. Your decision and the way you handle this will show on whose side you are on. If you're on the side of the unions and their money and their force, or if you're on the side of our communities. Thank you. Chair Yang, President Johnson, and council members. Um, thank you for allowing me this opportunity. I'm not here to talk about um, Mr. Feiselbane, officer, what's the proper name? Um, anyway, I, I just think it's amazing, the outpouring of support. Um, my name is Kathy Zek, and I am with Safety, Triage, and Mental Health Partners um, called STAMP. Our organization is working to enable a mental health provider to go on 911 mental health crisis calls with police. Way back in December 1st, PCOC Commissioner Laura Westfall and I went to Duluth to talk to Lieutenant Nagorski and DC Tuscan. Since then, the PCOC has been studying the issue of a mental health provider going with the police officers for mental health 911 calls. They are making recommendations and will be forming a work group to look at specific policies and procedures related to this. Um, since that time, Duluth has received, just on May 3rd, the Minnesota Police Chief's Excellence in Innovation Award. This is a statewide award, widely sought after. They competed with um, all of the other larger cities in Minnesota. Um, they have a um, mental health provider. She is a social worker. Her name is Anna Filipovich. Um, she and Lieutenant Chad Nagorski and Michael Tuscan were the ones that um, put this program together. Um, in in the article, it says police don't have a lot of options. They're not, the, the individuals are not in danger to themselves or others, so they aren't going for a civil commitment. They aren't intoxicated, so they can't necessarily go to detox. Um, the uh, social worker will help put um, Duluth on the right track and give those with mental illness the appropriate uh, treatment instead of jail time, um, another way to avoid the jail. Um, since this program has been instituted, Deputy Chief Tuscan was promoted to chief, and the former chief has taken a position in Tucson, Arizona, I believe. It was a larger community. Um, this is what's happening. This is happening all over the United States. Um, often people will say CIT is enough. Um, the DOJ has said that CIT is not an adequate measure to deal with those with mental health issues. CIT basically waters down the effort. Thank you, ma'am. I'm you to done. Wrap up. Okay, thank you. Are there any other speakers? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, my name is Ricardo Anaya. My address is 622 Russell Avenue North. I'm here to speak on behalf of the 
immediate reinstatement of Inspector Friesleben. The concern being expressed here and in the community uh, is powerful evidence that we, can, uh, that we are not anti-police, but pro-community policing. Evidence that we are in strong support of community conscious, culturally competent policing that shows up to protect and serve versus impose law and order. Inspector Friesleben represents that distinction. Please reinstate Inspector Friesleben immediately. All right, um, I see no other speakers here. So uh, council members, I, I thank you for indulging um, myself and others in terms of um, allowing um, the public comments and um, we won't speak to any of the public comments. And with that, uh, there is no further business before this committee. So I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you.